If you've never been to Holland, you're in for a treat today. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. We're gonna head off to the Netherlands and I wanna share with you some of the most beautiful gardens in the world. You won't believe all the color. If you love gardens as much as I do, you're really going to enjoy traveling back in time with me to the 17th century gardens of the Palace Het Lowe in Holland. While we're out, I'll also take you to the garden the Dutch are the most famous for. It's Kokenhof. There they have over six million flowers planted. It's the country's most famous and premier display garden with beautiful views at every turn. Plus, we'll take a look at some beautiful North American native wildflowers. And I want to share with you a recipe that'll be a big hit with your family and friends. Next, let's get on the road and travel back in time to a 17th century garden, Holland's Palace Het Low. Everyone likes to be treated like royalty, and when you're visiting the Palace Hetlo, royal is how you feel. A teacher of mine once gave me an analogy about garden design. He said that the great painters of the world studied the works of other painters and learned from them, and the same could be applied about learning to be a better garden designer. One of the best examples of garden design is right here in the Netherlands. These are the grounds of the Palace Het Low. This is a superb restoration of a 17th century garden, and the design is so elaborate, you might say it's fit for a king. Wies Erklens, the conservator here at Het Low, takes us on a tour of the grounds and explains just what went into such a massive project. The restoration here is one of the most elaborate I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite extensive. Well, for Holland, it's a very large uh, restoration, and there was a lot of discussion also about when it started. Yeah. Um, because in 71, it was decided that the Royal Palace uh, would become a museum. And then they started to think about restoration. And then research was done for about five years and the actual restoration started in 77. And it was decided to restore the palace in uh, the Baroque style, in the style of the 17th and 18th century, and also of the style in which it was built originally by William, King William III. And the architect who did the restoration, he said, well, if I restore a Baroque palace, I should also restore the garden because otherwise it's only half a job. And I understand the cost was around, in the 70s, about uh, 40 million American dollars. Yeah, the whole restoration, that's including the palace and the refurnishing as a museum and the, the restoration of the garden. This, in the 19th century, was a, a what we call a landscape garden, English landscape garden. In the early 19th century, Louis Napoleon, the brother of Napoleon, uh, lived in this palace and a geometrical garden like this was old-fashioned at that time. And before we started restoration, we did tried excavations to find where the, to find, look for the foundations of the fountains. And then we found already some mosaics of the fountains. I noticed that most of the parterres here, these fancy arabesque patterns, are made of boxwood. Yes, yes. Oh. One of the problems now is the the clipping of the boxwood, and that was also done by hand, and now they are trying to have a kind of machinery with a laser 
oh God. thing to, to get keep, it, it, to keep, keep the levels it a little just right. Just yeah. right yes. Because I would think exactly. the, the precision with which they have to prune all of these boxwood hedges must be uh, amazing. Well, it must be, and, and if you don't do it accurately, then, then the whole garden... It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The harmony no, no, that no. you sense with you, this doesn't it work. Has, it has to be very accurate. I think one of the most striking things to me about this garden is the, the embankment of turf that goes around three sides of it. Yes. Well, that's exceptional for Dutch gardens because most of the time, because there's so much water in Holland, most of the times the gardens are surrounded by canals. In William's time, there, was, uh, there wasn't all the woods which are there now, but it was mainly sand, and they were probably built to keep the sand out. I see. And another advantage was, of course, when you walk on the terraces, you have a good view on the parterres and on the layout of the garden. Yes, I think these 17th century landscapes are, are better appreciated if you can look down on them. On it, yes. Right. yes. Yeah. That's, that's why here, for instance, from the roof of the palace, you have a very good view of the garden. Gardens of this design and scale required tremendous resources of money and labor to maintain. This was a place where the king could show off a bit, entertain guests and heads of state. But even with all of this exuberance, a visitor like me can always take away ideas that I can use in my small garden. Another example of how gardens like these continue to inspire me is the use of this hedge and the way they've clipped it into a magnificent arbor. You see, this entire structure was built in the Queen's Garden here at Hetlow, and it was used for ladies to walk in the shade in the afternoon. The plant they've used here is European hornbeam. It's very suitable for pruning. It's hard to believe that this garden is less than 20 years old. It's a beautiful and meticulous restoration of a 17th century garden. Everything we saw here today, you could have seen then. When it comes to gathering ideas for my own garden, it's always easier for me to borrow a few ideas from the past rather than constantly reinventing the wheel. Kokenhof is a kaleidoscope of color. In fact, over six million flowers are planted here. We'll tour this very colorful and fascinating place when we come back. The choice of color is endless at a place like Kokenhof. Let's find out what goes into creating such a colossal display. Two months out of the year, over 100,000 people visit this garden each week to see a masterful display of flowers unparalleled anywhere on the planet. Here at Kokenhof Gardens in Holland, the Dutch have done a masterful job painting a beautiful landscape using the country's most famous product, flower bulbs. Peter Koyman, Promotions Director at Kokenhof, explains what it takes to create such a masterpiece. Actually, you should consider it as a cooperative uh, of about 90, 90 uh, growers, export growers. And all the, uh, we do the design at Kokenhof. We give them a design every year, different one. And they fill in with uh, the, uh, the bulbs. Who plants them? We do. We have uh, 22 gardeners throughout the year. We plant every year a new six million bulbs. And if you are a hobbyist and if you love uh, tulips, then this is the place to come. Because uh, we, the, one can find about 2,000 different tulips here at Kirkenhof and um, about 500 different uh, narcissi or daffodils and uh, again 100 different hyacinths. The name Keukenhof, fortunately, is well known all over the world. And people come here, uh, they, they love the, the serenity, the, the peace, the tranquility, the beauty of the spot. It is spectacular. Yeah, yeah it's really called the uh, show window of the Dutch uh, bulb exporter. And that is uh, the case. So it's not only tourism, but also the growers all over the world come here and look at, at what's available. The Dutch have been developing their reputation as leaders in the bulb trade for about 400 years. Even today, everyone seems to be involved in some way or the other, whether it's just enjoying the beauty of blooms like these or involved more directly in the bulb industry itself. No matter what, 
the Dutch just can't seem to get enough of these beautiful blooms. And I can understand why. Now, if I'm going to go to the trouble to plant tulips in my garden in the fall, I want to do everything I can to keep some ground burrowing rodent from raiding my tulip bed. Once the hole is dug, I cut a piece of chicken wire roughly a foot longer and a foot wider than the hole. Then I fold the sides, creating a wire basket that's six inches deep. Now I just place the wire cage in the hole like this. That would take one mean gopher to chew through this wire cage. Next, I cover the wire with an inch of a 50-50 blend of topsoil and compost. I add a little bone meal and then place my bulbs about six inches apart and then cover them with the remaining soil. Using wire does add one more step to the bulb planting process, but at least I know these bulbs are safe and sound. When we come back, we'll get reunited with some familiar faces, like these beautiful North American native wildflowers. Today we've seen some impressive displays in Holland, gardens full of daffodils, tulips, and hyacinths. Nothing like being in Holland in the spring. But you know in the summer they fill Kokenhof with some impressive summer displays. And a part of those displays, well, are North American native plants. So in just a few minutes we'll go back and have a look at some of those. But you know these North American natives have finally found a place in our gardens here at home. In my own garden, I grow things like purple coneflower, asters, and goldenrod. Now those are all perennials, but there are also some annuals you can grow, like these marvelous hybrid sunflowers. They're American natives. They've just been improved upon through the hybridization process. And don't forget about vines. Late in the season, this beautiful sweet autumn clematis graces one of my rose arbors. Just look at the fine, delicate flowers and the aroma really is unbelievable. If you're looking for flowers for your garden that don't require a lot of care and can add lots of beauty, you really ought to check into some of your local natives. Yeah. Now, when I was in Holland, I had an opportunity to visit with a garden author and horticulturist who's very enthusiastic about some of our wildflowers. You Europeans have taken American natives and improved them, and, and uh, now we're growing them back at home in our garden. <laughs> That's correct, like this Rubeckia, and how do you call it in uh, American? Well, this would be a black-eyed Susan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they are hybridized, they are selected, and now they give more flowers, I think. Yes. And the colors are perhaps a little better, but Just... I don't know the native exactly. And there's so many other examples here. Eupaterium, I suppose. Yeah, the big, tall Joe oh, Pieweed. Yeah. Yes, and, I grow it in my garden oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. And Tradescantia. Yep, the spider wart. Yep, a and very that, good shade plant. And phlox, of course. We have yeah. hundreds of varieties, cultivars in fact, from phlox, summer phlox and golden rod. Yes, that, oh, that is, a, a, grows very tall in the States. Tall, you normal. have the short dwarf ones here. And of course, one of my all-time favorites is the purple cone flower. Oh yes, it is over there. Yes, yes, there it is. And even if the petals are disappeared, it's beautiful. While this garden may be best known for its spring displays, what you can see here in the summer is nothing short of spectacular. Along roadsides in America, you can find some stunning displays of wildflowers and natives. For instance, every spring, Texas highways are alive with the flowers of blue bonnets, Indian paintbrush, and showy primrose, all blending together into a beautiful, endless blanket of color. Another outstanding example of a native plant that's been improved upon for our gardens is that of this salvia. It comes from Central America and it's called Victoria Blue. It's an outstanding summer performer and look how good it looks with these bright yellows from my garden. Did you know that there are over 100 native species of salvia worldwide and that salvia can be found on nearly every continent? These native salvias are tough and resilient garden plants which is why plant breeders are enjoying coming up with hybrids that produce outstanding blooms. Take a look at this series called the Salsa series from the flower fields. What amazing colors, and the flowers look like feather plumes. Salvias are a part of the mint family, and you can tell this by their square stems and the aromatic fragrance from the foliage. 
You see, the name salvia comes from the Latin word salveo, which means save, referring to the medicinal value associated with this genus of plants. Now, not to be confusing, but the common name for salvia is sage, and you find this name coming up time and time again when you talk about them with their common names. For instance, in my garden, I grow Mexican sage with these beautiful velvet-like blooms, and also a pale blue one called bog sage. And take a look at this one called autumn sage. Well, as you can see, there are a lot of salvias or sages to choose from. And we've all enjoyed the flavor of salvia in turkey and dressing at Thanksgiving. That wonderful flavor comes from salvia officinalis, or cooking sage. The holidays are a time when family and friends get together and food becomes a top priority. When we come back, I'll share with you a recipe for artichoke dip that's sure to satisfy everyone's appetite. Holiday gatherings are a must, and so is the food that goes along with them. Here's a delicious artichoke recipe that everyone will enjoy. In the past, I've spent hours going through recipes, looking for that perfect appetizer or snack. And you know, I always seem to fall back on the same old recipe, one a friend gave me years ago, and it's become one of my favorites. This is simple, easy to put together, and doesn't take much time at all. The only problem with it is that it tastes so good, I often eat all of it before my guests arrive. This recipe is centered around the bud of a flower of a plant that we all know, the artichoke. Now, of course, the artichoke isn't something that we commonly grow in our flower beds at home, but we can certainly enjoy its delicious flavor. Virtually all of the artichokes grown in this country come from California's central coast, and the fields of them growing are a sight to see. Even though fresh artichokes are hard to beat, canned ones are readily available in the grocery store, and I think they're actually better for this recipe. To put this together, just mix two cans of drained artichoke hearts quartered with one cup of mayonnaise and one cup of freshly shredded Parmesan or Romano cheese. Bake at 350 for 20 minutes. Now the aroma of this dip is outstanding. It's always amazing to me how three basic ingredients can come together to make such a delicious treat. Now, it's best served warm, in my opinion, with your favorite cracker. Now, the next time you have guests coming over, whether they're friends or relatives, you might try this simple recipe. It'll save you some time in the kitchen. We've seen some beautiful flowers in today's show. What inspiration! If you'd like to have a touch of Holland in your spring garden, remember the fall's the time to plant lots of tulips. And if you'd like some ideas on how to use natives in your garden, make sure to check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't but smile 